Let's talk about pandemics. What is a pandemic? What are the chances that there's going to be a pandemic in the near future, should we be worried? And what can we do about the risk of pandemics? Stay tuned and find out. What is a pandemic? Well, there's lots of definitions out there, but a simple definition, the one that I use is this. A pandemic is a large scale outbreak of an infectious disease. It crosses international borders and can cause disease and death in a large number of people. Now, pandemics are usually caused by what we call zoonotic pathogens. These are organisms that jump from an animal host to infect humans and then are transmitted amongst humans. And there is good reason to believe that the risk of pandemic, the likelihood of there being a global pandemic, has increased substantially over the last century. Let's take a look at a couple of these reasons. There's been a dramatic change in the way we use land. There's been deforestation and increased animal-human proximity in certain circumstances. And these things increase the likelihood of one of these zoonotic pathogens jumping from animals to humans. Then, of course, we've seen massive urbanization and increased population density. And this increases the chance of an outbreak spreading and it makes it more difficult to control. And of course, globalization and increased international travel means the possibility of a disease going global is increasingly likely. So before we talk about what we need to put in place to protect ourselves from pandemics, let's look back and have a look at the important pandemics and epidemics that have happened in history. There was the bubonic plague or Black Death in the 14th century and that killed up to 50% of the European population. Smallpox in the 16th century killed more than 50% of some local communities in the Americas. Cholera in the 19th century killed more than one and a half million people. And in the last century we saw the 1918 Spanish flu killing between 20 and 100 million people. Asian flu in 1957 killed an estimated one and a half million people. Hong Kong flu in 1968 killed a million people. HIV has killed more than 35 million people. And just during the time that I've been working as a doctor, so in the last 20 years we've seen SARS in 2003, swine flu in 2009, MERS-CoV in 2012, Ebola virus in 2013, Zika virus in 2015. And while it's true that these recent outbreaks, the last few outbreaks, haven't had the huge, dramatic, millions of people dying kind of impact that we saw with the Spanish flu, for example, it's important to note that in each case, we've simply just been lucky. We were lucky that the swine flu wasn't as deadly as we know pandemic flu can be. We were lucky that MERS-CoV doesn't easily transmit between humans. And we were lucky that the Ebola virus is not an airborne virus. The truth is that it's just a matter of time before our luck runs out. An otherwise unknown virus that is firstly airborne, that has a long incubation period, in other words, it takes a long time for a person to become symptomatic, so they have the virus but they don't know that they're sick, has a short latency period, in other words, they start infecting other people early before they know that they're sick, and is deadly, could be just around the corner. And I'm not even gonna talk in this video about the risk of bioterrorism, but let me just say that with the changes in the costs and availability of things like gene editing technology, the chances of there being a bioweapon developed and deployed are increasingly likely. Okay, so let's talk about what we can do to prepare for pandemics, what we can do to mitigate the impact of pandemics if and when they occur. But before I carry on, I just wanna give a big thank you to DCP3 for supporting and sponsoring this video. DCP3 stands for Disease Control Priorities 3rd Edition. DCP3 is an up-to-date and comprehensive review of the efficacy, the effectiveness, and the cost-effectiveness of priority health interventions. Essentially, DCP3 is a tool that can be used by countries to make policy choices about health interventions based on systematic economic evaluation. It's available for free, it's online, so you can go to dcp3.org or click on the link in the description below, I'll have it there. And let me just say this, this tool is absolutely unique, there's nothing out there like it. And I've actually been using the DCP3 content in preparing for this video. So if you're interested in pandemics, I'll put a link in the description below that'll take you through to the DCP3 pandemics chapter. Right, let's talk about preparing for pandemics. What can we do to prepare for pandemics? What can we do to mitigate the risk of pandemics? What can we do to mitigate the impact of pandemics when and if they occur? Okay, we think about pandemics in terms of what we call spark risk and spread risk. So spark risk is the risk that a novel pathogen emerges with catastrophic pandemic potential in a human population. And spread risk is the risk of that pathogen spreading in a human population, both locally and then internationally. And we're gonna talk about what we can do to mitigate each of those kinds of risks. Right, in terms of spark risk, we know that these pathogens usually jump from an animal host to humans. So we need to improve animal disease control in high-risk areas. And I'll talk about what I mean by high-risk areas in just a second. 
and we need to improve our detection and surveillance of known and unknown pathogens in high-risk areas. So by detection, I mean we need to be able to identify pathogens. And so we need lab capabilities and we need them in the places where we think these pathogens may emerge. And by surveillance, I mean we need to have systems in place that tell us what is happening with respect to infectious disease at a population level. And what we want is we want all of these capabilities in areas where we think there's a high spark risk. So in places where we think that there's a lot of animal human proximity, so think for example of poultry farming, or places where we think that there's a lot of ecological disruption, so think for example of areas where there's deforestation. Now let's talk about spread risk, right? So we've talked about spark risk, something starting. Now we want to talk about what do we need to put in place to prevent something from spreading. And in that sense, we want to think about locally and globally or internationally. So I'm not going to talk in detail in this video about what needs to be put in place to have local outbreak control capabilities. I've created a whole video on that and I'll put a link in the description below. You can click on that link, watch that video if you're interested. What I do want to say is this, we need to have those local public health capabilities to investigate and control an outbreak locally or domestically. We want to have those things in place sooner rather than later. Now in terms of international spread, there's a very important legal instrument that I want to talk about and that's called the International Health Regulations. Now the International Health Regulations or IHR requires of signatory states and I think there's about 196 countries that have signed up, it requires of them to report certain disease outbreaks or public health events to the World Health Organization or the WHO. And it also requires of countries to build capacity to prevent, to detect and to control diseases that may affect other countries. So if you're interested in the IHR, I'll put a link in the description below. You can click on that and find out more as well. Now, as well as the sort of outbreak control capabilities that I've been talking about, we need to also think about surge capacity. In other words, in the event of a global pandemic where millions of people are sick, we need to be able to scale up our outbreak control capabilities and coordinate things at a massive scale. Now for many low and middle income countries, this surge capacity has typically come from the international community. So if you think about the international community getting involved with the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa, for example. In the event of a global pandemic, we're gonna see two things happening. Firstly, the international community that's responding will be spread thin, right? This thing is gonna be happening everywhere. Secondly, a lot of the high capacity countries that ordinarily would make a big contribution to the international response, those countries will have domestic problems of their own that they'll be trying to respond to. And so again, of course, this highlights the importance of developing local capacity and doing it now. Look, outbreaks are going to continue to happen, right? That's a biological inevitability. And eventually, one of these things is going to have the potential to kill millions, if not billions of people on planet Earth. So we absolutely have to take this threat seriously. So what country do you live in? Do you think that your country is in a position or has the capabilities to respond to a global pandemic today? I'd love to hear from you, so why don't you leave a comment in the comment section below this video. And please do stay and watch another video. And again, a big thank you to DCP3 for their support.